Hello, everyone. Welcome to Breaking Barriers from the PGMOL. The Breaking Barriers series continues to offer great insight into the refereeing profession as part of the organization's wider work and commitment to diversity and inclusion. We're really excited about sharing so many more fascinating stories and real life experiences across several areas of the beautiful game. The focus of today's discussion will be around mental health within refereeing. Now, whilst many people are comfortable talking about their physical health, we know talking about and seeking support for our mental health can be a challenge. We all have mental health just as we have physical health. As our bodies become unwell, so too can our minds. Mental health can be a challenge. One in four adults and one in eight young people experiencing mental health problems each year. Now, this session will draw on personal encounters and setbacks as we aim to create an open environment so that referees and everyone involved in the refereeing community can talk openly and be supported. It's now time to introduce our special guests. First up, it's Emily Carney, a FIFA listed assistant referee. Emily is also a PGMOL mental health champion and part of a team that work hard to create a culture to promote positive mental health, encouraging honest and open conversations and breaking down historic stigmas. Also joining us today is EFL referee Andy Woolmer. Andy has refereed over 500 EFL matches and in doing so joins a very, very select group of distinguished colleagues commitment right there that is and lots of minutes clocked up Andy can you recall your first ever EFL game I can yeah, yeah. Kidderminster Harriers against Notts County uh, how was that yeah uh, um, surreal really having I was 10 years as, as an assistant referee so uh, while I was refereeing on uh, the then uh, the then a conference to to obviously take charge of a of a of an EFL game uh, felt a little bit different. Uh, made sure that obviously when I left the changing room, I didn't take the flag with me, you know. So you know, <laughs> and uh, just just great, really, and and um, just th thoroughly enjoyed that. M my parents were able to come to the game as well. They'd been with me to a lot of matches over the years, and uh, subsequently. Uh, Oh, my wife uh, has also been to a lot of games as well that, that, that I've refereed. Uh, so it's it, from a family point of view, it, it, it's good to have you the support that you've had in the background, seeing you uh, progress in your career. Yeah, absolutely. We're definitely going to come on to that a bit more. Emily, just tell us a little bit about your first experience in the game. Um, so, yeah, I started refereeing when I was 14. So this is my 10th year. I feel like a veteran now. And I'm sure Andy will tell me I'm not a veteran. But yeah. I feel like a veteran now. Um, so I started refereeing because my mum told me that I had to go and do it because I hated referees when I was playing. Um, I was that one annoying football that probably, as referees now, we all hate. So uh, my mum said to me, like, you need to go and referee because you're like, you think you know the rules better than any of the rest. Uh, it might make you a better player, might have you a bit more empathy for the rest and you get off the backs. And then once I started, I'm sure everyone says that you just get the bug for it. And now I'm 10 years down the line. That's so funny. I love that story of how you started. Um, at this point, I'd also like to just tell you a little bit more about myself. So I'm a presenter at Sky Sports News, big champion of all types of diversity in sports. And I had the pleasure of hosting a Breaking Barriers session last season on diversifying the industry. So I'm really looking forward to sharing some of my insight and stories into the barriers that I've broken on my journey as well as we get going. So, Andy, you've told us about your first EFL game, but tell us a bit more about your journey into refereeing. Yeah, I started uh, when I was about 18. And uh, uh, initially, I, I, I the path of progress of refereeing is is very much to try and get to uh the next level and when you start at local parks you just really want to get to uh pitches that have got you know advertising holdings around so that it's it's you know it's a step up in level and and it's basically a, a path that's that's followed by all, all referees really that that you you try and progress to the next level um each time and 
and obviously there's certain times in your career where that can that can take a long while to to make it to the next level and uh, and the setbacks uh, that come on your way um it is where you you have to dig deep and as i say get the support from your close colleagues and and uh, family to uh, to keep to keep going and and, and persevering yeah absolutely Emily, you told us about your mum getting you involved and, oh, okay, if you think you can do better, why not give it a go type of thing. Did you think at that point that this could be a viable career for you? No, definitely not. I think when I first started, it was, it was I was 14. I didn't want to do a paper round. I didn't want to do anything like that, like what my, some of my friends were doing. So it was easy to go and referee two games on a Saturday, back to back, um, and you would come on with like £40, I think it was. Um, so it was easy to go and do that because I didn't want to go and do a paper round. And then as I started getting older and progressing up the, so I was in the youth leagues, as I started progressing up the age groups, I remember people would tell me, you can't do this. So obviously when someone told me I couldn't do it, I was like, no, I am going to go and do it. So I think it started, it was like, you can't ref the under 21s leagues because you're under 18. So I was like, right, wait till I'm 18. And then I got on the under 21s league in now Bolton and Berry District. And then um, I was refereeing through the WSL um, and the right the different divisions through the WSL and then I remember um, someone told me well I, someone asked me the question what do you want to be when you're older so I said I would love to be a professional referee and they looked at me and was like well that's not going to happen so what do you want to be and I was like no no I want to be a professional referee that's what my career will be in and they turned around and said to me like well would your mum be proud of you for being a referee and I was like well ultimately my mum's happy whatever I do and if I'm happy that's what makes my parents happy um, and that's how I always do everything now in life and in refereeing whatever makes me happy that's the route I choose because I'm a big believer that life is very short and it's definitely too short for us to be unhappy in anything we do um, yeah. that was when I thought no I'm going to go and have a career and try and pursue a career in refereeing uh, because I love refereeing and it makes me happy and to ultimately prove all these people wrong that look at me as a match official or as a female match official that we can't have careers in football. Yeah, that's brilliant. That's such a good story. And I think I can resonate with that a little bit as well, because before I was a broadcaster, journalist, presenter, I was actually a lawyer and I changed career. And it was it was a similar thing in the sense that I, I didn't think because of people's views that I would be able to make it as a presenter. And I thought, oh, it's not really for me. And then it was a case of well, it's something I want to do and proving people wrong. So it's, and I want to ask you a bit more about that as we get into this chat about determination and resilience. But before we get on to that, Andy, mental health and raising awareness of it, it's so important in, in all aspects of life and careers. How do we make it more of a subject that people can talk openly about? I think uh, to try and embrace, just to try and embrace it as much as possible, just to try and, as I say, uh, be open. And uh, that's, again, it's where family support comes in uh, because, you know, it's, 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 easy to, it's easy to talk through things with, with family um, uh, and, again, close colleagues, close friends. And, Emily, you've got background in, is it psychology, your background? Tell us a bit about that. Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I did my undergraduate degree in psychology uh, and then I went on to do a master's in neuroscience and neuroimaging. Um, so I think when I was doing my degree, one of the topics in second year was mental health and we had to go and do a placement um, at a charity and run a session. So I did mine at a mental health charity in Bolton um, and I ran a, I think it was a social anxiety um, session. So we did like 10 weekly slots for people who wanted to come and sign up to the session. Um, and I think when before I did this uh, placement, I was quite naive to mental health. And I think I was quite fortunate that I'd never seen anyone in my family or around me uh, who suffered with it. And I personally had never suffered with it. So I was quite naive and didn't realise the full extent until I did this unit and this placement. Um, and I think it really changed me as a person and opened my eyes to how prevalent it was in society. Um, I remember running a session and we had um, someone who came and he told me he was going to take his own life and I think that really hit me quite hard where I thought about it every day for I would say probably a year or two I thought about this person every day to think if he was still here and it quite affected me quite badly for me to think about him that much and no one actually has heard this story apart from a few people um, and I remember we 
I had to do a reflective piece with our lecturer. So I wrote my piece and submitted it. And the lecturer brought me in for a meeting um, to discuss because I'd put in there how it had affected me and how it like changed me as a person. And now I realise and uh, like how prevalent it is. And I remember him turning to say to me, like, unfortunately, in the profession of mental health that we find ourselves in, um, you need to realise that sometimes you can't save everyone. Um, and I remember we sat there for, I think it was about 30 seconds in silence. And I remember it vividly. We were just sat staring at each other. Um, and I was just sat thinking, I remember saying to him, like, maybe not. And like, maybe that's an unrealistic goal to try and save everyone. But everyone who I come across who needs help and is brave enough to ask for help and speak out, I will do my best to try and help them to make them feel like they're not trapped in their own head. And they've got somewhere to go and somewhere to help. So that's how since being 19 when I did the when I was on the placement since then I thought I need to go and do something to help people. Wow that is a really powerful story do you feel like you've taken some of those lessons now to help build your own resilience as well? Yeah I think it definitely changed me as a person um, and made me more mentally resilient and probably made me focus more on my own mental health as in things I can do to prevent um feeling stressed or anxious at times and it made me really like internally think how I can do things to maybe me stop me getting to a place which some people do suffer um which is really unfortunate and like you said in the intro like how prevalent it is in society with one in four people annually um suffering from mental health um it just helped me really identify and think of things that I could change that I do in the week or in the month to um, help myself really yeah because overcoming challenges and setbacks is something that you both will have experienced on and off the pitch um Andy could you share any examples of any challenges or setbacks that you faced in your careers and and also how you overcame them yeah one of the one of the uh, initial setbacks uh, you have is is when you first get into refereeing not getting the promotion that, that, that you want to the next level uh, so again, that's 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 your first taste of resilience. Uh, unlike as a player, you, you, your career is almost mapped out by how good a player you are. And but as a referee, it can take a long while. It can take time. It can take a number of seasons to to progress to the next level. Uh, and seeing that goal and realizing that the opportunities is is uh, is is important. Um, in terms of on the field uh, with injuries, uh, I suffered an injury uh, three seasons ago, um, which which made it difficult for me uh, initially just just to go out and train. Very difficult initially to go out and walk, let alone train. Um, and that's why the uh, that the help, guidance of of uh, close family, support from the PGMO um, in terms of their uh, their psychology, their sports scientists. Um, I was very lucky to to work with um, Vicky Smith, who's a sports scientist with PGA MOL, um, and with her guidance and support, um, I was able to get back um, first and foremost uh, into the gym to get some strength work done, and then we we set goals every week, every month to move on. Uh, we didn't get too far ahead of ourselves uh and in doing so it, it, it's uh it's got me back uh it's got me back refereeing and and um it's got me back do, do, doing what, what what i love best training refereeing um and, and moving on yeah that's great and just speaking about the power of resilience and and the ability to display this mental toughness both of you work in such a high pressured environment now I, I don't want to liken it to my own job but there is a certain amount of pressure in live tv but for me i can't see the faces that are watching me i know there's an audience there you know behind in their in their own living rooms but i can't see the the faces looking at me whereas you both have crowds of people watching your every move your every decision how do you deal with that pressure emily we'll start with you um I think when I first when I first got onto the WSL and there was big crowds in and we was on TV games I I struggled a bit and I think credit to the girls who I went out with who we always said when people would you could tell when people were struggling because either the voice would change or they wouldn't speak on the comms um so credit to them they used to pull me out we used to say pull us out of the hole they used to pull us out of the hole and get me back in the game um and I think 
that that really helped me and the girls who I went out with really did a lot for me when I used to go probably spiral um, into a hole and think about decisions that I'd made um, and things being wrong and they, they might not even have been wrong but I perceived them to be wrong um, so I think it was credit to the girls that were there but I think dealing with the crowd sometimes you just forget they're there really like, um, I think you just get used to people shouting at you which is a sad thing and it is a sad reality of refereeing that you do get used to either people shouting or people shouting and cheering and sometimes you can't even with the comms which does help a lot I think um mm. but yeah do you learn to just sort of block out the noise if you like and you know and to try and focus on what you know what you're doing but it must be hard sometimes yeah I think because you're processing things in your brain especially on the line you have to process like the speed of the movement and the offside sometimes you just forget that people are actually there and you can't really hear anything uh, which I think is weird considering the pe how many people sometimes are in the stadiums that we know can't hear anything um, but you do because you're processing things going on and obviously you're watching and there's split seconds to make decisions you do I always say I go deaf in refereeing so if anyone calls me ref I'll never reply but if you shout Emily I'll probably turn around and reply more than often than not. Um, so yeah, I always I just zone out. I'll remember that next time at a game when you when you're there, Emily. Yeah. <laughs> um, but Andy, what about you? I mean, five hundred you know EFL games. The what? How do you block out that noise? I mean, have you just become accustomed to it as well? I think I think uh, following on from from what from what uh, Emily's mentioned. I think when 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 we first started out, um, it would be, you'd be on the local parks, and um, it would be one or two people would be criticising you, and you you would hear those voices really really clearly. When you actually uh, go up through through the levels, you actually find that uh, that as, as as Emily said, you, you actually don't hear because because when there's a hundred or a thousand people or two thousand people or whatever when they're all when they're all saying you've made a decision wrong they almost they almost drown each other out so yeah. um it uh it, it, in some respects uh i think i think the work that we do on the on the parks um uh is is great grounding because because it, it's it all it is 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 it's magnified when you when you when you move up through the levels but to a certain extent it it it, it, it gives you that that sort of thicker skin and and uh as I say, you 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 almost become deaf to it, really. Yeah. And Andy, you mentioned a couple of times your support system and 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 how important it is to have family around you. Is, is that your go-to if you've had a, a difficult day or you know a difficult game? Is is it your family who would be your support network? Oh, w w without doubt, and 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 that's been uh, all the while. I've been very fortunate in that in that respect. Um, my dad was is just a is a massive football supporter so to to discuss match incidents with my dad and and obviously my mum like all mums they always say you, you you've done well and 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 they're just proud to see you to see you out there um and and again uh, the the important thing with 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 family and and uh you, you get home and and myself and my wife and, and, and my two sons we'll, we'll talk about the game but we'll also talk about the the, the, the other bits as well in, in, in involved in football because you know there are periods that that, uh, that it's not just about it's not just about the game it's about you know get, traveling there okay getting back okay looking after yourself and and I think they're important and and, and that's where as I say the support network that you have uh, it, it is massive you know it's it, there's more to <laughs> when you get home there's there's more to life than 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 it, than football it seems massively important between three o'clock and five o'clock but you do have to understand that there is downtime uh, at home as well yeah well said uh, emily uh, who are your go-to support networks would you say uh, i think i'm really lucky that i've got a good group of people in family friends outside of football who it probably helps that they don't understand anything about football because it's my release where i don't have to think about it and then within refereeing um, I've got a good group of friends in like Rebecca and Natalie. I know they'd always answer the phone if I need anything, um, which I think is really, and I think it's really important that not only they make me better as a match official, they also make me a better person. Um, and they've both helped me get through some really rubbish times in refereeing. Um, I remember in October when I was stressed with work and 
I was struggling with refereeing in a sense where I put a lot of pressure on myself to be like not make mistakes and be brilliant. And we have a group chat and I think I hadn't spoken in this group chat for over a week. Um, I'd just not really gone on my phone. If I go on the phone, I don't really, I wouldn't really reply to anyone. Um, I was just probably scrolling through social media. Um, and then we had a game together and it came through on the Monday. And I remember it was an FA Cup semi-final and I cried for three hours when the appointment came through because it meant that I wasn't going to be on the final in December. Um, and I mean, it seems dramatic. And after I'd rationalised it, I thought it's not the end of the world. I've got a FA Cup semi-final. Um, and ultimately, I was out with my two closest friends in refereeing, in Natalie and Rebecca, uh, which is probably what I needed at that time. So I remember we went out before on the Saturday. Our game was on the Sunday. We went out the Saturday to Illuminations with Natalie, Natalie's two little girls and Rebecca. Um, and that point, it wasn't about cup finals. It was about getting back to enjoying refereeing. Um, mm -hmm. And ultimately, refereeing was where I was happy. And I knew if I was happy, I'd be at my best. So them two got me out of like, I wouldn't say it was a dark time. It was just a time where I struggled. It probably was a dark time for me because I was struggling mentally. Um, and I don't think them two knew the importance of them two being my friends at that time, which got me out of that like dark place in refereeing I was at the time. No, that's great. And Emily, you're also a PGMO, a mental health champion as well on the scheme. Can you tell us why you took this role up and also the level of support that's out there for grassroots refs? Yeah, so I think when it was released by the FA, it was piloted with 11 county uh, county FAs in the north. Um, and then it worked its way into PGMO at the start of uh, the season. So I think it was just about having match officials feel comfortable with someone, someone to go to or to talk to and engage in conversation with. And I think if you look at the list of mental health champions we have, there's a diverse range from levels, people from different backgrounds. Um, so I think it helps that if someone wants to speak, there's a diverse list, whereas I might be able to resonate with a female match official more than um, maybe one of the male mental health champions would in the same way we have some observers on like Clyde uh, the observers might be able to resonate with Clyde more than they would with me um, so I think it's really important that we have this diverse list to help uh, people throughout grassroots and in the PGMOL um, so I think that as mental health obviously the visibility is increasing massively throughout football it's important that we also look at different aspects of football it's not just players and fans uh, we need to address the well-being of referees as well uh, oh. and like you said if we look at national stats men are less likely to access psychological therapies men are less likely uh, are more likely to report lower levels of satisfaction and ultimately the biggest killer in men under the age of 45 is unfortunately suicide so if you look at the group of match officials we have nationally and in the pgm well a lot of people tick the box of under 45 and male. So I think it's important that we do something which the PGMOL are to try and promote positive mental health and speaking out about our mental health and going to somewhere where you might feel that you're comfortable to speak to. Mm. And there's also a psychology team, isn't there, within the PGMOL, which you both work closely with. It must be great to have their support. Andy, what kind of support do they offer? Uh, from, from, from my own point of view, uh, first class support really has, uh, uh, before I, just before I went in for my, uh, for my operation, um, I, I was given uh, support from, from Liam Slack, uh, who works with, with, with us as a group. Um, he came to my house a few times and we, we, we just talked about things in general. We broke, we broke it down really well. Bits of it. We, we spoke about football. We spoke about refereeing. Uh, but we also spoke uh, about, you know, moving on and uh, how downtime and how you can uh, improve uh, yourself as a person. Um, and, and, and I think that's important as well, because, he, you know, they offer a, a, a bigger picture um, so that so you're not just focusing on, on one on, on as I was, I was at the time, I was just focusing on the injury. Um, but, but he, he, you know, he was taking it outside the box and, and we were able to explore avenues uh, uh, to go down, uh, which improved my mental health state. Uh, and it gave me the resilience uh, to put things on one side and then move on to others. Yeah, absolutely. And you, t you have talked a little bit about the injury that you had, but can you tell me a bit more about what journey it must have been going from the injury to then rehabilitation to work your way up. I mean, that must have been some journey for you mentally. 
It was, yeah. And and again, one thing that 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 uh, that we did, um, as I say, again, working with the, with the sports psychologists uh, and the and the uh, and the sports scientists, is we took it each step at a time. I, I wanted to, I, I wanted to uh, uh, you go out as soon as soon as I could start running. I thought I could I could just go and get cracking again. But but you you soon find that 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 the, the steps have to be done. Uh, in accordance with 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 what that what what they uh, are following, you know, following the science, as they say. Um, one of, one of the key words that that, that I picked up from the um, from the surgeon that I work with is, you know, I said, you know, how about uh, going out there and sprinting again and everything. He says, just just concentrate on 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 what you can do, not not, not what you can't do, and uh, and and from that we we were able to build. Uh, and work uh, just in small steps so so we were never getting never trying to get too disappointed if, if things didn't happen straight away I think that's such good advice as well just generally isn't it just a, just a very small snippet of focus on what you can do not what you can't do I think that's really good in, in you can use that in so many aspects of life and um, I want to ask you both about what it's like effectively managing a situation when you've got high emotions all around you emily i think you're definitely gonna want to answer this and i can tell you smiling already what how how do you effectively manage situations where there are high emotions involved um i think it's about probably looking calmer than what you feel on the inside when everything's going crazy and people are running in or trying to speak to you um, i think it's just about the perception that you were calm and you might be calm on the like looking calm on the outside and everything's going crazy inside but that's what I think it's just about trying to stay composed and ultimately your heart's probably racing at 150 mile an hour and you've got to process all these things going on but it's mm. just about trying to stay composed and I think you can't practice that really off the field it only happens when something happens on the field of play and it just goes off and that's when you then realize oh gosh I've got to react now um, and I think it only comes with when you do it more often. Ultimately, sometimes people might never have to react to these situations ever in their life, and um, that's just what it is. But, and some people will have it every week and be perfect at reacting to it, but I think it's about staying calm and composed. Yeah, and when we spoke just before we started the recording, you talked about how, you know, being thrown into the deep end, because you are still very young, 24, and to think about what you've done in this time, and sometimes it is, like you said to me, sink or swim, isn't it, in those situations, and that can be a steep learning curve, but often a good one. Uh, so you mentioned you can't prepare for those things, but Andy, how do you mentally prepare for a game? Do you have any pre-match rituals? Yeah, uh, there's one or two things. I, I think we all, we all <laughs> yeah, we do. I mean, I used to joke about this. I always used to say, um, I always used to say, oh, make sure you put your socks on before your boots. But that's been a little bit. That's a that's a jokey one. That is. Uh, now, I, 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 there's always certain things that that, that I do, and and I cert, uh, a little bit of OCD, I suppose. I like certain things in certain places before I go out. I'm particular about the time I go out to warm up before a game. Um, I'm particular about making sure that uh, everything's in, in literally in a little in a in, in a little line just before you go out to referee. Uh, cards, whistles, spray, just 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 little mental things, um, and then just little reminders to yourself. Um, just I, I've always said um, one one of the tips I picked up many years ago was. Warming up's very, very important, but it's also important that you get back to the dressing room just a little bit earlier than normal, just so that there are, if there are any last minute checks, so that you're never rushed whenever you go out uh, uh, to, to start your game. Um, and, and, and going back to, to what we said about uh, being put under, under pressure when it's all going off, again, so one of the tactics that, that uh, we've worked with with the, with the psychologist team is it's just to manage your breathing, just to manage your breathing, just to manage your focus. And, and as Emily says, that's that that helps you then keep calm. It keeps you composed. Um, and, and, and and from there, you can then obviously deliver uh, what, what you perceive to be the, the, the correct way out of it, of, of an emotional situation involving, you know, a number of players or technical staff for that matter. Yeah, brilliant advice. Emily, do you have any pre-match rituals that you do? Uh, yeah, I have quite a few. I'm a bit of 
that are superstitious. So I have um, in the car to a game, I'll always drink a Red Bull and I'll always enter. This is so cheesy. I'll always enter like either the gates to the ground or wherever we're refereeing um, with the song Believe by Yolanda Adams, which is off the, um, the film Honey. That's like my song I have to enter um, the ground into. And then before the game, I have to have a caffeine chewing gum before we warm up, a caffeine chewing gum before I go out to assist or ref, and then one at half time as well. Um, and I think that's it. That's quite, quite, um, I'm a little bit OCD. I put my equipment on, so I have to put my left sock on, then the right sock, left boot, then right boot. And it's just, if you come out, I don't know how it, you form these superstitions. I think you do it, and then a game goes well, and you think, Oh, it's definitely because I put my left sock on. It's probably not, but then you then just form this habit of this is what I have to do before a game. And I know now when I go out, everyone's going to watch when I put my socks on. <laughs> that's, that that's, that's, that's interesting because I'm, I'm, I, you say you're left left first. I'm always right. You say first, and the same the same with the boot. And again, I always want to make sure that the laces are actually tucked inside, uh, so that I always think whenever you see a player uh, doing his laces up, Jenny, you think. Oh, <laughs> if only it done, done what I did, make sure that they're really, really not right underneath. So there's no chance they're ever going to come undone. But, but the, the right leg, left leg, that's, that's bizarre, that is, isn't it? Are you right handed then, Emily, or left handed? or Right handed. Right handed, yet yeah, you always put your left. Yeah, I don't know why. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm literally the way. And if you do, it doesn't feel like a sink. It's like I need to do these yeah. things because I've put them on the wrong way. Yeah, that is and it's, <laughs> I wasn't prepared for what answers were going to come from that question, but I absolutely love it. But also, I have to say, Emily, I'm a bit worried about how much caffeine you're having on match days. Yeah, I know that the girls say that, but it doesn't really do anything to me. And I think it's not caffeine where I'm buzzing. It's caffeine of focus, but I think it's very psychological. It's definitely, some might say it doesn't help with performance, but for me, it's psychological. But that's it. That's your, your routines now. I'm just thinking, obviously, if you take the caffeine on a Saturday, all that is, when are you getting to sleep? Wednesday. <laughs> By the time I've been on as long as Andy, my list will be as long as a Harry Potter novel for superstition. <laughs> You're going to have to come and check back in with you, you know, 10 years later and see, right, well, how's the ritual list now? Oh, I love that. It's three hours long. The thing is, all this preparation, it can't ultimately prepare you for some of the things that go on. And... When you've had a difficult day taking charge of a game, how do you deal with it? Because it's similar to my job in the sense that if something goes wrong or you're having a difficult time on air, there's no time to deal with it at the moment. You have to put it to one side and carry on because you're still live on air. So how do you deal with that, Andy? How, If you're having a difficult moment or a difficult game, how do you deal with it? Try and park it and do you come back to it later in your mind? Yeah, I, th I think again, I think you you, you break it down. So it, you, you drive home from a game, you do you you talk through that professionally with uh, with with your coach, you talk it through with with close colleagues, and then I think it's important that when you get home, um, uh, Sharon and I, we we we, we will have a, a period where we we the, the games the game almost becomes irrelevant because we've part of that, uh, and we'll all set aside some time the next day. Uh, where I'll go into into what I term as my office, and I will do some work on where I thought I went wrong, where I felt I could have improved, and that will be done in, in and I'll have a, a, a time slot for that. But but I'm also conscious to make sure that 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 it's done during that time, and then when I come out of the office, I then go in to as I say my normal what I would consider to be my weekend mode, uh, and 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 again we're together as a family, but not to not to go over. Um, you know, match incidents, uh, because that wouldn't be fair. Mm. That's that's really good. And Emily, how about you? I mean, how do you cope with those difficult moments during and then after as well? Um, I think during, it's probably easier to forget during because you've now got the next decision to make. So mm -hmm. during, I find it quite easy to, people say I used to struggle, but like I used to struggle quite a lot where I would dwell on decision, but now I'm like, no, next decision, like we need to get the next one right. If it if it is, was wrong the previous one um so I'm quite good at that in a game I think after a game is when I dwell on it so on our games if they're on a Sunday and then on the Monday while I'm in work but that's not how I work I'll watch the whole 90 minutes back and I'll look at all my decisions that 
maybe I can recollect in my head um, like the minutes and then I'll look back over and I'll clip them, send them to my coach, um, which is Steve Child and then James Mainwaring as well, who's my referee coach. Um, and then we'll look at the decision, see if it's right or wrong, what we can do better, how, why we've got the decision wrong. And then after Monday, that's me. I think like that's really helps me to know I've part the whole game. I can then go on and train for the rest of the week and go towards the next weekend or Tuesday night, like tonight when I've got a game. And are there any decisions which have still play on your mind now from time to time? Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, so. I, <laughs> Don't know whether can we go over these decisions? <laughs> you can say generic. <laughs> Thank you. I was going to dodge you on. Um, yeah, there are a few that you you think, I wonder if it was right or wrong because sometimes you don't have the camera angle to prove if you are right or wrong. But ultimately, you in your gut think you're right, and people obviously will always think that we're wrong. Uh, but there is a few that I still can recall and think. I still wonder if I was right on them decisions. Mm -hmm. And what about you, Andy? Because you know. This is something that is such an obvious point, but something that people just forget often is that you're making these decisions in real time, you know, split seconds almost. So is there things that sometimes play on your mind still from the past? Yeah, I think there will be. And and, and there'll always be games that, that you think, oh, if, if uh, I'd have made a different decision there. I think, again, you, 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 try, and, you try and be fair to yourself as well. You, you, you know, you, you try and rationalise it and say, well, Maybe I could have been in a better position to have, have judged that differently. Um, maybe my thought process could have been better in, in, in that respect. The, the one thing that we always say about uh, in, in PGMO, we always say about learn and grow. And, and I think there's occasions where you, you, you will make a mistake. But if you can see, if you can see where um, you went wrong, where it will benefit your game, learning from it. And as I say, and hopefully that will then make you Make it be make you a better referee for the next time a similar incident occurs. Mm. And Emily, I know you said that your mum said to you, "Oh, you know, if you think you can do better, why don't you give it a go?" But what's it like for you now, watching a different match that you're as a viewer, as a spectator? Um, how do you now look at the referees? Is it different? Yeah, you can't watch football in the same way again. I don't think after you've refereed. I think every and people will shout at me. So, like, say a ball gets played through, I'll go offside, and they'll go, "Shut up, Emily!" And I'm like, "He's offside. The flag's going to come." And then whatever play will develop, and then the flag goes up, and they just look at me like, "Stop spoiling it." Yeah. So I think you can't watch it the same because ultimately you are always going to be a referee. So sometimes I try not to watch a lot of football because my life is saturated in football and with training and stuff like that. I try and not watch a lot of it because I think I spend a lot of my time either away from home with football um or training it's nice to just get away from it and switch off from it what what do you do what other things do you do to switch off oh my God, good question. hobbies and interest probably, away from the game probably binge watching a series i'm binge watching drive to survive at the minute and now the f1's back so even better but it's on a sunday isn't it so i've got a compromise I can't wait the and I can watch the F1 every Sunday. Love that. What about you, Andy? Have you, what, what things do you like to do to totally switch off from refereeing and football? Just uh, go out and uh, have a nice, pleasant drink. Uh, and uh, um, again, switch off. Just, just try and just what, as, as Emily says, just try and watch something that's not uh, football related. Uh, We'll, we'll watch a box set or something and and, and, and as I say, you, you're able to, to to move on then, aren't you? You're able to, to park your football life and and and, and have your, your, your non-football in life, so to speak. And I think yeah. that's the best way. Oh, I also love a box set and a binge watch as well, so I'm with you both there. But Andy, what I was saying to Emily before about how when you watch a game now, if you do watch one... Are you? Is there more empathy towards a referee, or is it the other way? Do you sometimes feel, oh, you know, not I could have done a better job, but you know that might not be right, you know, or I wouldn't have done that, you know? Is there any of that when you're watching it? Uh, no, no. To be honest, I'm I'm quite simple. I suppose I suppose I've been battle hardened, haven't I, over the years? And um, no, I just I just. I'm, I'm, I want the team, my, my team's catcher in town. I want them to go and do well. But so I try and see them when I can. I live in Northampton, so I, obviously I want Northampton town to do well. Um, and 
but generally speaking, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I can watch it as a as an enjoyment point point of view, and it's quite nice to have a have a day where you know, as I say, nobody's shouting at you over a decision, aren't they? You know? Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. And the thing is, I mean, that does actually lead me on to something else that I wanted to ask you both about, which is. It's not the shouting in person, but the online abuse, you know, and, and this is towards many people in many different careers. But what steps would you like to see to try and combat this kind of online abuse towards referees, Emily? Um, I think it's about probably showing the more humanistic side to us all that we're not just these people who go out and ref and we don't care about what we do. Because ultimately, I think everyone, I don't think a lot of us would give up our time and the amount of time that we spend outside the house and away from families and things that we love if we didn't want to do well and wasn't there because we care about the game. So I think it's about showing the human side of us and even the stuff like I always look at Mike Dean. Mike Dean's probably the most loved ref we have on the Premier League because he shows the human side of him and he has a joke and you can see that he's got a sense of humour. I think everyone likes him because of that. So I think that's important that we show that side of refereeing that and the things that we're doing with the breaking barriers, which shows people's um, things that they do outside. And obviously we had the parenting one to show what people go through. Um, I think it's really important because it then also shows the life outside of football and people can mm. relate more to us and stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. Do you agree with that, Andy, as well, that you just... It, 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 you just need people to realise that, yes, you're referees, but you're also human beings. And I, and I think during the Breaking Barriers series, we've, we've, we've seen this. Uh, we've seen um, that it's transcended uh, us all in, in respect of, of diversity, uh, in respect of we, we, we are all human. We have all, we, we're, all, we're all football fans, uh, ultimately, uh, and, and our part to play in that is refereeing. But outside of that, as I've said many times, most referees I speak to, we've all got a team we support. We all like the game in general, to be honest. And, uh, and, and we'll, you know, and, and, and it's great that, that as I say, uh, we have got lives outside the game. Yeah, there's box sets to be watched. There's binge watching to be done. There's drinks to be had. <laughs> no, do you know what? We, we've almost reached time now. So I just want to say that thank you both so much for that honest and open conversation to share your, your experiences as well. It's not always an easy subject. So I really appreciate it. It's been so insightful. Um, uh, so, yeah, big thank you for your excellent advice and contributions. This has been a really important topic. I hope that everybody watching feels encouraged to talk to or support those around you with or who have the potential to have mental health problems and by delivering a panel discussion like this today is a huge step for the pgmol it shows a real commitment to actively improving our game and uh, don't forget breaking barriers will return next month so look out for details on that you can follow the pgmol across social media just search for at fa underscore pgmol and all of the previous sessions are available this one will be as well to watch back in full on the pgmol youtube channel so please do share like, and subscribe thank you again and let's continue to feel confident to speak out about the need to promote positive mental health not just in refereeing but in everyday life thank you bella thank you